Hello, and you are live with Angular Air. My name is Kent C. Dodds, and I'm your host, and super excited to uh, have a couple of really awesome guests on the show today. And it sounds like somebody is giving some feedback. If everybody could mute, that would be great. Um, OK, except for me, because I'm talking, so that's tough. <laughs> OK, so um, yeah, we're going to be talking about Angular with web components, both Angular 1 and 2. Um, so this is going to be an awesome show. Um, and yeah, we have a couple of guests with us. Kara Erickson is actually a panelist as well, but she is our guest. So when I say your name, unmute yourself and say hi so everybody knows who is who. Um, so, Hello. Yeah, that's Kara. Uh, and then we have um, Rado Kirov. Hey, guys. And Rachel Maury, or Maury. Oh, man. <laughs> did, I, did I say your name right? Uh, more right. <laughs> more right. Oh. Hi. I'm, I'm so bad. You don't, you don't even have to have a foreign name, and I still mess it up. Wow. <laughs> um, okay, and then we have Patrick JS as our panelist. Hey, guys. And Amy Knight. And Carmen Popovichu. <laughs> And actually, Carmen uh, put our episode together today, so we're super uh, grateful to her for um, getting a good group together for us to talk about web components with Angular. So um, just a few quick announcements before we get started. Next week's show is going to be on Angular internals with uh, Taro. Oh, man. Taro, I'm so sorry. I practiced your name like six times, and I can't get it. It's Taro um, Parviemen. Oh, man. Sorry, Taro. Uh, you can correct me next week. But uh, yeah, it's going to be Angular internals. It'll be really, really cool. And then um, we have um, accounts on Twitter and Google+. If you follow us, you will know what's coming up and what has come. So do that. Um, OK, so let's go ahead and get started. I'd first like to start by introducing our, uh, or allowing our guests to introduce themselves a little bit, uh, what, what they do with Angular and um, why they're so awesome, and maybe even where they work. So uh, let's go ahead and start with uh, Rado, and then um, Rachel and Kara. All right, yeah, so uh, I'm Rado. I am uh, on the team uh, here in Mountain View. So I've been working on Angular for about one year now. I've been working in Google for uh, four years. So before that, I was on AdSense. So um, responsible for things like show ads, JS, and ads by Google JS before that. And uh, on the Angular team, when I joined, I was working on Angular Dart. And uh, since then, I've been working on Angular 2. And in a past life, I was a mathematician uh, before Google. But Was that magician or mathematician? Math kind of the same thing, yeah, right? <laughs> the whole thing. The, yeah, the full spectrum. <laughs> mathematician. Nice. Yeah. Um, I, and that, I think, is just a testament to why it's so awesome that Angular uh, two is being written in TypeScript because it enables uh, you Dart fellows to um, help us out on uh, the JavaScript side as well, right? Yeah, so uh, AngularJS and Angular Dart used to be two different projects, and uh, our team was split into two, basically. Um, so I was working only on the Dart side. I was not touching the JavaScript side. With Angular 2, we just have one repo, and uh, it transpiles to Dart. It's written in TypeScript. So our team basically doubled. That's pretty wild that it transpiles to Dart and then transpiles back to JavaScript. That's hilarious. Yeah, yeah. No, it's uh, there's some cool memes you can make from that, but <laughs> it's it it really uh, speeds up our workflow and uh, enables us to do more. Awesome. Thanks, Rado. Um, go ahead, Rachel. Sorry, you cut up there for a second. Yeah, sorry. Uh, <laughs> Um, I'm Rachel. Um, I work for OpenTable. Um, I'm a UI developer primarily, um, so you know CSS, HTML, JavaScript. Um, I've been working in the web industry for about 15 years, um, and I've been with OpenTable just a little over one. Awesome. Uh, and. Um, you're being a little bit uh, modest, but do you want to tell us about uh, the NG Comp Talk? Uh, and uh, you and Kara uh, did that together. Oh, um, yeah, we did a, a talk at NG Comp this last year on, um, on <coughs> Angular 1x um, web components in Angular 2, sort of like a cross section of doing one task throughout all three of those. Um, 
Cool. And Kara? Um, well, yeah, so I also work at OpenTable. Um, I work on the Angular side, so pretty much most of the stuff that I do is um, on our Angular applications. And yeah, I was a co speaker with Rachel at the NGConf talk. So I'm not really sure what else to say. But, yeah. Cool. So let's jump into uh, our content. So the first. Uh, first question I think that uh, could really kick us off is what are web components? So I'll just leave that at that. And anybody can answer these. <laughs> so evidently it's a big mystery. <laughs> um, I guess the way that I would put it is it's uh, like a suite of standards. Um, you know, each one is kind of its own thing, but they work together to to actually supply functional web components um, on the web in a way that we haven't been able to do up, up until now. Maybe could somebody describe the problem that it solves? That sometimes helps us understand what it is and uh, why we care. So for people that are uh, familiar with the video tag, with the input tag, with all these tags that you just put one tag into HTML and it brings so much more functionality than that, right? It has representation, it has behavior, but you're just stamping one HTML, right? So it's, it's a little bit magical, and the browser does all this for you. Uh, at some point, you might wonder, why can't I do the same with my own vocabulary? So extending the input, the video, the audio tag, uh, web components allows you to extend, uh, to extend the browser's vocabulary and to define custom HTML tags that have very rich and complicated behavior. So I think this is the, the big value proposition of those standards. So how is that any different from a, like a regular directive? Like I could make my own AZ or like NG video tag. So what, what's the difference? The big difference is the browser does it for you. Uh, and you're, you're right on the, on the spot that it looks similar, and there's a reason why it's similar, because uh, uh, the functionality, the the the, solu the problem it's directive solve is the same problem that uh, web components solve, except they solve it through different means. And uh, the hope is, when web components solve it, uh, if all the browser makers agree on those um, proposed standards, then the mechanism be becomes available in all the browsers, and you don't need the JavaScript libraries anymore. But of course, we're not there yet. Boy, I feel like the, the web is just a bunch of stepping stones. <laughs> <laughs> You're always shimming something. Yeah, that's so true. Or, or transpiling or compiling or yeah, crazy but, stuff. But uh, that's the only way to move forward, actually. Uh, if, you, if you wait for this big, uh, the whole world to change to let you do what you want to do, it might never happen. Totally. Um, so what, um, how, how do Angular and web components uh, intermingle? Like, what, is that an, yet another stepping stone? You make a directive that uses a web component, or, or how, do, how do they work together? So uh, I would let, I think, uh, Kara and Rachel answer this for Angular 1. Uh, I think they have more experience with uh, how to do this in Angular 1, and I think I can answer how this would be possible in Angular 2. Cool. Uh, Rachel and Kara, this is kind of your ng-conf talk, right? Yeah, I think I'll defer to Rachel on this one, because this was her. Pass the buck. <laughs> so um, you're saying, would you combine web components with Angular 1? Is that, was that the question? Yeah, yeah. How, did, how does Angular 1 and web components work together? And, and is it easy? Is it hard? Is there uh, a real benefit to doing so? Um, I'm, I, I don't want to be too... <laughs> be too decisive on, on that issue, but um, I, I don't think it's terribly useful now. Um, if, you, if you use um, a polyfill, you know, and get some of the shadow DOM behavior, there's, there's some helpful things, but um, a lot of what, what components are, are offering, in my mind, um, you can sort of simulate with Angular. Um, and it's not really worth bringing in a lot of extra JavaScript at this moment on top of the entire Angular 1 library. Um, but that's just my opinion for production. 
Okay, so is uh, is our conversation more about uh, how this is how web components are useful on their own and how they're useful with Angular too? Would that be a more interesting uh, topic of conversation? <laughs> should, should we step back and uh, maybe uh, talk a little bit more about the four different uh, specs that are under the umbrella web components? Um, because I think. Uh, the, the specs stand on their own, and uh, they're under the umbrella web components, but uh, each one of them, uh, you, you're free to use it by itself, and that's kind of, in fact, what we do in Angular 2. Okay, so, yeah, let's it talk be useful. About that. I think it will be useful to our listeners to, uh, to step through each one of them. Cool, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> All right. I, I was just suggesting it so you guys can take it from there. Uh, no. Okay, so uh, <laughs> to enumerate them, uh, so what do we have? We have custom elements. Which is just the the just the behavior of uh, telling the browser every time you see this tag, run this special JavaScript for it, right? So the tag foo is gonna create a object my custom foo. So that's custom elements. Uh, we have HTML imports, which allows us to basically what we used to do before with XHRing getting the HTML, stamping it on the page. Just with one declarative tag, the browser will go fetch the resource and uh, execute the JavaScript in it and have access to all that, uh, all the HTML within that uh, page. So you can uh, declaratively fetch things instead of imperatively using XHR. Uh, we have the template element, which is just inert chunk of DOM. It's uh, telling the browser, go parse this HTML, but don't do anything with it, right? So don't, fix, don't fetch the image resources. If it has a video tag, don't create an actual player. Don't do any of the expensive stuff. And uh, I'm missing one more. Does anybody remember? We went over three. Shadow DOM. Shadow, of course, the, the biggest. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I've noticed you can look at the Shadow DOM if you turn it on in your... Uh, developer tools, you can actually inspect the Shadow DOM, at least in Chrome, I don't know uh, what it's like in other browsers, but uh, like if you look at an input tag and the video tag, and uh, what are there other elements that are using the Shadow DOM right now? It depends on the browser. Um, if you inspect pretty much any form element um, in Chrome, you'll see some Shadow DOM. Hmm. Like, uh, yeah. Radio tag, um, range slider. Cool. And we should we should explain what Shadow DOM is too. I think we. Oh, yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Rachel, why don't you go ahead? You gave a pretty good um, the description in your ng-comp talk. Um. Well, I guess I'd say that what it is is basically a um, it's a complete DOM that is sort of disconnected from the rest of the DOM. So you can have multiple self-contained DOMs all on one page. And it provides a CSS encapsulation, which is kind of the, the killer feature. No more, uh, right, so while using Shadow DOM, the CSS within that Shadow DOM does not leak up to other parts of the HTML above it or in any, or any other Shadow DOMs within it. So it's fully encapsulated. and. Uh, but is there is there still a way to be able to access that CSS when needed? Well, so that's a that's a funny part, right? So encapsulation is great uh, until you actually don't want it to be there, and you need. So you want to be protected, but sometimes you want to actually globally override CSS. So something like theming, when you want to have a consistent theme across your whole page, uh, encapsulation gets in the way. So the spec introduced a few kind of escape hatches, uh, a few ways to reach into the Shadow DOM and set CSS properties in the Shadow DOM, but by default, you don't. And, uh, and sh the Shadow DOM is actually, I think, in my opinion, the, the most complicated part of the uh, Web Components uh, specs, because apart, completely apart from the CSS encapsulation, it has the projection mechanism, uh, which you know as the, I guess you know it as transclusion, from Angular 1x, uh, 
I think Shai had some uh, funny things to say about transclusion in his Angie Watt talk, if you haven't seen it. Um, so basically oh. the same thing that transclusion achieves in Angular 1, which is taking a chunk of DOM and mixing it. Uh, so as you're writing a web component, you, uh, you're the author of it, and then there's the user of your web component. And usually they're different people, right? So let's say you're, a wi you're writing a widget library, and uh, your, web, your component is that widget that other people will be using. So you provide some functionality, but you have the right extension points where the user will be able to plug in their own content. And uh, that mechanism of plugging in custom HTML within the HTML of your component, that's a projection mechanism, and uh, the tag that does that is the content tag. So uh, all part of the shadow spec. That actually is uh, really valuable, that content tag, because like, I, I have a table um, at, here at Alianza that I built. It's called AZ table, and it's really cool, except um, not being able to transclude two elements in a single um, uh, directive is a real frustration to me, because I have, um, like, this is what I want to show when you're creating a new item, and this is what I want to show when it's, uh, like, an item that exists and has data, like, because there are two different ways that you can, yeah, those two different insertion points. And so I, I have to make my template a uh, function that will actually change the template based on uh, the contents of uh, the user of my directive, which is like, it, it's kind of kind of wonky how it works, but it, it works really well. It's just, uh, it'd be really nice to have something. It will, it will be hard to describe that API to the user of your directive. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and, right. and there's no way an IDE could, could figure out what that API is either, so you're not getting any sort of completion if, if like, your IDE supports that kind of completion. So, yeah, absolutely. And actually, I think that's the big thing that's coming with Angular 2, like, that I'm super excited about is the uh, how easy it is to reason about the API of uh, your components uh, and, and huge contrast to Angular directives now, I think. And that applies really well to web components as well, um, and Angular 2 integrating with those. So, Carmen, you had a couple of questions in here. Uh, did you have one in particular you wanted to, uh, to shoot out? Yeah, I was, um, because I, I also spoke with a lot of people about Angular and web components. And then, uh, like, usually the, the first or, or the most uh, common Ask question is what is the difference between directives and web components? So maybe that's a good question to, to answer here. I'm not sure. I totally uh, heard your question. Uh, oh. what's the difference between what? Sorry. Sorry, the difference between directives and web components, or yeah, custom elements from web components, basically. Well, one big thing is the, the bundling, right? So for um, directives, you get the custom element, you know, benefit. So you can use your tags wherever you want. You get all the, you know, the scripting benefits. Um, but in terms of styles, they're not really bundled, right? So with web components, if you use HTML imports and like templating syntax, um, you can kind of get everything at once. You have HTML, JavaScript, and CSS kind of all in one package. That's one big one. Yeah, I think that that's a, a really important one, actually. Um, when you use all of the different specs together, like you make use of custom elements, imports, Shadow DOM, um, and templates all together, um, you can import everything together, including the CSS, using that one import link. And that's a really awesome workflow. And then if we're talking about Angular 1, obviously there's the encapsulation benefit too, right? You get, if you're using web components, you get the whole Shadow DOM thing, um, which you also get in Angular 2, but not Angular 1 quite yet. Um, and, I mean, there's a difference between um, a custom tag in a directive with Angular 1 and a custom tag in, in, um, in web components, and it may be a little bit of a pedantic difference, really, uh, because practically speaking, they're pretty similar. But um, every every like custom element that you use in Angular One is an HTML unknown element. The browser doesn't have any facility for you to truly register that. 
custom elements provides that, um, the browser will actually recognize it and upgrade it. So some of my directives um, are um, not like element directives, but they're uh, behavior directives. Uh, it, do I have anything like that uh, with uh, with web components? So like for example, ng click would be a good example of that, or it just adds a click handler. Uh, is do I get anything like that from web components where I can just have some sort of behavior component? Not by itself, no. Like they don't have. A, it's pretty much just on the element level. Um, so if there's a custom like attribute that you want to add, you've added it to you know an element level directive using sort of the Angular lingo. But HTML has ad hoc attribute vocabulary already sort of built in. So. So the way I see it is uh, there's a common um, there's a common uh, computer science notion of in uh, inheriting versus composing, right? So every time you want to extend something, you can try to inherit or you can try to compose. And uh, web components are basically the inheritance pattern for web elements, right? Because you can take one element and it already is a HTML element, your input element, or so on, and you extend it with certain new behavior, but you can only do one extension, for example, or you can chain a few of them, but you cannot uh, have multiple inheritance, uh, like common to many programming languages. Uh, whereas Angular directives, I view them more as a composition model, where on one element you can have many different directives, and all of them create those JavaScript objects and neither of those JavaScript objects are truly inheriting from the HTML element. They're just coexisting with the HTML element, working with it, but they're not extending from it. So the mental model uh, is very different, and the overall big goal is the same declarative extension of your behavior, so basically teaching the browser new HTML vocabulary. In that sense, they're the same. In actual means of achieving that, they're very different. So, no, uh, go ahead, Scott. Sorry. Oh uh, no problem. Uh, if you got something less left left on this, can't go ahead because I was going to yeah, ask. Yeah, actually, I had a quick question on this. So, um, the inheritance pattern, like I, I'm not, I haven't, um, I'm not too familiar with that inheritance. Pattern. Like I understand inheritance, how it works. The, the one, and so I don't know how you work around this issue. So, like, with the inheritance pattern, you kind of get into a situation where, you're like, okay, this is my table with click handler rather than being able to uh, and that extends my table and just adds a click handler to it rather than being able to compose the ng click for example or whatever click thing on it so how do you get around issues like that where you just wind up extending these components uh, to add even small custom behaviors is there a way around that or is uh, is there a best practice for something like that I think so far we've seen um, frameworks that are leaning heavily on web components building on top of them. Um, Polymer has had a way to sort of globally add like ng click, like they have on click, um, and the, the framework that's built on top of web components provides that. So okay. you can have a, um, instead of thinking of um, a web component with a click handler as a whole new web component, you can have a bigger API. So you can say any component can have any set of events or any set of extra behaviors, any set of properties, and then you are inheriting, you're, you're extending only into one new web component, but it can have many uh, events or many attributes or many properties. So even though you're using your one extension point, uh, the custom behavior comes through other APIs. Okay, I think it's just a different way to think about it. That, that's cool. Okay. Yeah. Sweet. So the question I have, well, I have two, but one is testing. So, like, how does this change how we test our applications now with web components? Like, is this going to be, like, a different, like, phenomenal way of testing, or is it pretty much the same thing, and just you got to think differently? Like, because I'm thinking about, like, the encapsulation, I'm thinking about the CSS, I'm thinking about the templates, and it's just like, wow, this seems like a lot of overhead to test a component, and, like, maybe there's, like, this component is relying on, on all, like, all this third-party stuff that we have to mock out. It just seems kind of crazy. Um, and then the next question, actually, you guys can answer that, and I'll, I'll ask the next question. 
So I haven't done any uh, extensive work in uh, web component. Like I haven't built that many web components itself. I'm familiar with the spec and how Angular 2 uses it, but uh, we don't fully use all the um, uh, all the web component uh, specs. Um, so yeah, I, I I'm I'm not familiar. If you go fully into web components, uh, how would you test that? Um, what I've seen is uh, it definitely um, certain tools like uh, Protractor or like basically end-to-end -end testing, which needs a global view of your whole application. It definitely gets a little bit more complicated, and it has to use those escape hatches I mentioned earlier, the deep selector. Um, so yeah, you have to be aware that there's web components, uh, especially if, you, if they're natively implemented, right? Uh, if the browser is preventing you from going deep into the component and looking at its, at its shadow DOM, your tools have to be familiar with that and uh, use the escape hatches like the deep selector, the shadow selector. And, uh, uh, but there are ways, right? So it's just, uh, it, it adds, the tool makers have to think a little bit harder, but uh, the mechanisms are there. Sweet, thanks. Um, the next question is, like, I hear a lot of talk around, like, you know, web components, and, like, there are so many frameworks out there, Polymer, and there's this other one. I don't know, I forget the name of it, but it's really Bricks. awesome. Bricks. Yeah, yeah Bricks, yeah. yeah. But, like, I've never, you know, I've never seen or hear people, and, Rachel, I'm, I'm sure you might have done this, like, just take the web component approach and just build out their own thing. Like, there's always, like, some type of framework that somebody has to use. It's like... You know, like the way I think of it is, it's like, well, if it's just a spec, why can't we just, you know, just use web components? Hey, if we like, why do we need some type of framework to actually interact with these web components on some type of high level? And I just want to know that that's just like, what do you guys think? Like, is that going to be a common thing that where, like, if you want to use web components, you're gonna to have to go through this framework or this polyfill, or you're just gonna go ahead and just build them yourself because they're native in the browser? And like, I get a lot of questions about that, and I'm not too sure how to answer that. Well, um, we love frameworks, you know, so um, I imagine that <laughs> in the future, yes, a lot of people will interact with low components through frameworks. Um, I think it's a little bit of a chicken and egg situation right now. Um, that's why the, when people say web components, they often mean the frameworks because they, they aren't natively implemented everywhere, so you need the polyfills, and also there, there's some much debated, like, interface things going on about how, you know, are, is there going to be, like, an element tag or is there not, and stuff like that, like, the the various um, frameworks are taking those debated items and kind of running with, with it so that people can work with it and see, you know, if it's if it's a good way to, to deal with web components or not. Um, but you can totally just sit down with the spec, um, have the polyfill, open in your browser and hack without the frameworks. Yeah. Mm. So uh, I also think, like I agree with Rachel, that one of the biggest problems with web components is that they're still not fully supported. So for instance, uh, last time I checked, uh, I think there was one spec, and I think that was for the templates that, um, that was finalized, but all the other specs were still under revision. And I also know that there's there's a lot of discussion around um, uh, browser vendors and who's implementing what. So, um, yeah, until old browsers implement all the specs, then it's it's very hard to get around without the, the polyfills. So I think that's yeah, and that's also one of the things that's making uh, that's making people quite reluctant to, to use them. But yeah, I think they're. I think they're. They they will come with a lot of benefits for sure, uh, especially even in the way of thinking. I think there's yeah. They they absolutely will, um, and I, I think you know they're exciting. So when you hear about it, you kind of want to try it, and and it's a little bit of a not yet scenario um, on a lot of them. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, often the most really exciting ones like Shadow DOM. There's still a lot of debate about that. Um, Apple commented just a week, couple weeks ago about um, like the deep selector and the shadow selector that, that Rado was mentioning. Um, they had an alternative proposal for some of that uh, that I actually thought was a really good idea. Um, so 
they can't really implement until they've settled all the questions. What is this? Angular 2? No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> cool, that actually clears up a lot of things for me. Getting all the browser vendors to agree on something is probably harder than even getting all the frameworks to agree on something. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. So, well, yeah. Uh, IE also think, uh, so Apple is, Safari is looking into some of this. IE also has a page where they're tracking the implementation of uh, new features into uh, their new IE Edge and uh, all the Shadow, the Shadow DOM custom elements HTML imports are under consideration. Um, that's, that's as far as I know. Uh, the template element is the only spec that is uncontroversial. And it's the simplest one, so understandably. It's, I think, basically almost in almost all browsers. So what effects do you think web components have on performance? Uh, so web, web components live only in Chrome. So you're, you're it is, huh? You're, you're kind of cutting out there. OK. Yeah, how about now? Yeah, so you say again. Thumbs up, thumbs down. Yeah, you're good. Go ahead and start, right. again. start again. All right. So, uh, so all the four specs are living Chrome. So uh, native performance is different than shimmed performance, right? Uh, you can expect very different performance characteristics. And uh, one learning, basically, that I think the Angular team went through, and it looks like the Polymer team and everybody who works in this space. Uh, they we well, we've learned is really it's really really hard to shim those specs because they are when they implemented natively they're awesome but they're very big specs a lot of complicated behavior getting a fully reliable shim is really hard without sacrificing performance and uh, what is happening now with uh, the new polymer um, shim the I guess polymer builds on the web components uh, shim and uh, the shimming behavior that Angular 2 will be providing is uh, all those shims are giving up correctness, so they're not fully shimming the whole spec, but we're trading that correctness for performance. So if we limit ourselves to some parts of the spec, we can get good performance. If we try to shim the whole spec, uh, performance suffers. Well, and and this is th this is something uh, that's so th that's what uh, we're doing in Angular 2, and uh, it looks like the Polymer team is doing it uh, with their web components shim. So it is uh, it is basically a common pattern. So um, when I start when using I start Angular 2 on my huge app um, tomorrow, tomorrow. Oh. <laughs> you're not using it already. We're <laughs> yeah. five. <laughs> yeah, I'm way behind the time. Uh, so, so what, what, do you think that web components will be ready when Angular 2 ships, or will we still be uh, shimming these web components in those browsers for a long time? Um, I think browsers move slower than frameworks. Uh, there's a lot more. Yeah, the process is a lot more involved. Uh, I mean, if you have you tried to read those specs, they're uh, pretty involved. Uh, uh, you know, almost. Legal language uh, frameworks have a little bit of flexibility to move faster. We don't need to write big specs and get everybody to agree. Uh, so I, my guess, and again, I, don't, I, I can't predict the future, but uh, my guess is that Angular 2 will be out before the, all the browsers will agree on what web components are and how they're going to look like. Uh, and that's why when we're building Angular 2, we are looking into those specs and um, so maybe this is a good uh, segue into how Angular 2 is using the, the web component specs. Uh, we are not, so we're going to be using uh, the Shadow DOM lingo, the Shadow DOM spec, but through our own shim. We're not going to be using, for example, HTML imports because we have ES6 modules, which kind of solve the same problem, right? Uh, with XHR and ES6 modules, if the module loader gets figured out, uh, we'll have the same behavior. So we're looking into the specs as a set of tools, and we're picking the ones that make sense and the ones that don't. So yeah, let's talk a little bit more about Angular 2 and how that, 
um, um, we can move, move to Angular 2 web, web components. Web uh, so, so when I start when using I start Angular 2 tomorrow, tomorrow, or I mean when I start when yesterday, yesterday. Yeah, <laughs> you, you, you already promised me you're using it tomorrow. Right? <laughs> yeah. So, um, do I have to use web, have web, components? web components? So we would be. Uh, you, 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 we would be using uh, we will be using uh, the web components internally, and what you will be seeing is we will be telling you that you can use projection using the content tag, right? So whether you want to call it you're using web components or we're just using the semantics or the lingo of web components. Uh, that's uh, you know that's a technicality I guess. Uh, so <clears throat> so uh, yeah so you'll be you will be thinking about web components but uh, we'll be shimming it if the browsers don't support it. We would be uh, shimming some features maybe not all the features. We'll be we'll be a lot more flexible than the full spec with Angular two. Okay. So I, I won't be able to just to like drop. From like some like web component some from some like website and so, like so, so those are two different. Uh, so sorry. So Angular two has concept components, right? And those components, they're not web components, right? Uh, so I was saying, well, as we're building those components, we'll be using. They, they would be feeling like web components in some places. So the template for your component will have some CSS protection. Uh, just like a web component will, but it won't be exactly a web component. So that's one question. How are Angular 2 components related to web components? A separate question is if in my application do I want to use web components within my Angular 2 components, right? So that's the sec second question. And to that question, the answer is yes, right? So we've built, uh, and we, we did actually have to change a few things from Angular 1 to support that, but uh, we did. Uh, we are going to support including web components into your Angular 2 application, just like you can import any other HTML tag. So the changes we had to make is uh, the word of web component changes a few things, which is, uh, for example, in Angular 1, um, ng-click, ng-mouse over, you kind of had a fixed list of all the events that can fire in a reservable browser, right? Like, you can go statically before we build Angular, we could have gone through and figured out all the events. In web components, the list of events, the list of event names is unbounded, right? You can have any event name. So we had to come up with some new template syntax, which you've seen as this uh, parents event listeners. So now we support, instead of having ng-click be one directive, ng-mouse over another, ng-whatever, now we just have one syntax that supports any name for an event. And uh, this is basically um, necessitated by the uh, advent of web components, right? If you don't have that, a web component can fire any event. So uh, we, you will be able to use web components within Angular. And uh, those web components could be built by Polymer, could be built by uh, Bricks, or basically any, any library that uh, builds web components. Um, the inverse question is a lot trickier, and I don't have an answer for whether web components can use Angular components. Uh, that's um, a lot harder since Angular components don't look like or behave like web components. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, so, so, oh man, I totally had a really good question, and now it's gone. Oh yeah, here's my question. Yeah, so this this may or may not be totally related to web components in general. Um, but I'm curious, uh, but I'm curious in, in Angular 2, Angular will, I will I still have the compatibility have that I have with directives today that I can have like behavioral have directives? Um, can you define behavioral? Yeah, so like um, we yeah. were talking about it a little bit earlier with web components and how it's an inheritance model, not the compatibility model. I see. So just having a directive uh, that is triggered, let's say, or an attribute, and having like a large number of directives on the same element. Yeah, exactly. You, mm -hmm. you can definitely have that. We love that. That's a good way to extend through composition. So you can have a one component, uh, like an Angular component, and you can have many little directives that are triggered by attributes. And what's even cooler, that because we have dependency injection, the component can inject 
those directives into itself. So on the same elements, you can have uh, many different Angular extensions, right? So you can have uh, one component on that element with five directives, and all of them can work together. So that allows for some very flexible APIs. Yeah, I was just going to say, it sounds like it, it solves the composability problem of uh, web components. So you can use them together. That's one flexibility, because we are stepping kind of away from that model. Cool. I like so, that. Yeah, I, like that. I, I prefer the composability model over the inheritance model, uh, personally. But that, yeah, that's that's word on the street is that's preferable. Can you, right. can you, can you, can you ahead, talk sorry. about inheritance like, facing uh, directives? So, like, in a one, one um, we have the ng dash for all of Angular stuff. And now, in now in Angular two, we also have the ng dash back. Back. And it's becoming like I another, mean, another, another uh, can you talk more about, more about that? And, uh, and, uh, uh, I guess just, I guess general stuff. General stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It, with relationship to web components, or are you just curious about? Um, I guess like in the benefit of. Benefit hey, of hey guys, really quick, let's let's just pause really quick. Rado, could you Rado, please uh, mic your um or, or mute your mic when you're not talking? Thank you. Go ahead, Patrick. Yeah, I guess like in when you because we were talking about inheritance versus composability. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, so like it, with with web components, you have to inherit previous ones. Where um, in Angular two, you just compose them, and then um, when you compose like many like components or directives or behaviors together, you suddenly have um, a lot of directives on this particular element. And um, can you talk about how like in Angular 2, we're kind of like maybe they're pushing like the, the prefix for this behavior, so so just like crazy. Like um, I guess like I guess I'm talking about like when you have composability of of uh, a bunch of directives together, um, you run into a problem of having to prefix your behaviors. Otherwise, your element kind of looks kind of crazy um, because you don't know what what option or directive uh, belongs to what. I guess it was kind of an open question. So, um, one thing about uh, one one big difference that I think it's related to your question between uh, web components and Angular two components is that web components, basically the custom element part of it, the custom elements have uh, one global namespace for all um, for all custom extensions, right? So on this one page, I'm going to say, every time you see a tag foo, create my custom element foo. And that foo is available everywhere, right? So it's completely global. And uh, something something that, uh, you know, having global things is, is not a good pattern for very big applications. Uh, and something that we have flexibility, because we don't use custom elements in Angular 2 to do is, we specifically say within this template, these are the directives that would be active. These are the directives that we would understand because we don't use the custom element uh, registry. We create per template registry of directives. So within these directives, uh, within this template, I can have these directives. Within uh, another template, I can have another set of directives, and they might have the same tag, right? So the tag is very common if it's like name. You can bind uh, or you can teach Angular within this template name should instantiate components name A. Within another template, it can instantiate name B. And uh, th this this would this would help with the problem of uh, you're just looking at a template and you're trying to figure out which custom component will get instantiated there. And uh, as you're, we, we're, we're still um, brainstorming on this. And uh, one thing we're thinking about is uh, as you're declaring which directives are active with your template, we're thinking about uh, allowing you to, uh, as you include the directives, we're thinking about allowing you to provide your own custom namespace. So if you envision uh, overlapping directive names, you can say, well, as I'm importing these directives, prefix all their selectors by 
dash ng or dash you know uh, ionic or so on. So that would allow you if you if you have so many different uh, component libraries and they have an overlap of uh, component names, you can uh, avoid those overlaps. So again, uh, pr those are problems that you might hit in big applications, but uh, we're thinking about them right off the bat instead of uh, uh, supporting small applications. And then when you, the application gets big, uh, it just becomes a mess. Yeah, I, I'm definitely in favor of reducing the amount of uh, uh, prefixing that we have to do in our apps. It's, it's kind of crazy that we're still having to do that. Um, um, global namespace is not fun. So um, I think we're, we're uh, winding down in our time. And so <clears throat> unless anybody has any questions they'd like to ask specifically, I'm going to go ahead and go into the Q&A. Does anybody have any other questions they wanted to ask? Amy, I think you're trying to talk, but we can't hear you. That is really sad. I'm sorry, Amy. Um, yeah, that's too bad. Um, OK, anybody else have anything? I'm so sorry, Amy. <laughs> OK, let's just go ahead and we'll move into the Q&A. And we'll make sure to test it out next week, Amy, before the show, make sure it works. Um, OK, so the first question that we have, I think actually all of our questions are from Jeff Welpley, so I'll make sure to not ask the, um, uh, the troll questions. For example, Patrick JS, you need to get a haircut. <laughs> Work, working on that. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so this next question, I think, is a legit uh, question. Um, so why does integration to web components matter right now since they have so many performance issues and will be largely unusable for some time until browsers catch up? So basically, what do I care right now? I think that's a pretty good question. So um, in the, let's see. Uh, understanding the, the specs is important, even if you're not using them, right? So. Uh, Basically, what we had with transclusion, like we def we had exactly this, we we're solving the same problem that shadow dot projection solves. Uh, we we're solving it in Angular one, so it, it is a common problem. Everybody had it. We we're solving it in one way, uh, having a spec'd out cross browser solution for that same problem. It is definitely better and preferable than having every library solve this problem over and over with subtly different semantics. Right? That, that's, uh, that's how you can get into big problems, that you switch between libraries and the tool set is different. Uh, so it's good to, it's good to understand uh, the technologies that are coming up, but yeah, whether you're using them fully or you're just using whatever Angular provides you, and what Angular provides you is similar to what will be coming to the browsers, uh, that's that's fair, right? So it's OK to just stick with what Angular will give you. It's just what I'm saying is Angular 2 will be giving you things that would be feeling similar to what Web Components will bring one day to the browsers. And would potentially one day be able to drop you know, the custom implementation for a more performant native imp implementation and be interoperable. So it depends on what, what level you're looking at that, that problem from. But yeah, I totally agree with that. So I think it's also like it's more on that. Basically, it's uh, don't break the web and progressive enhancement. So essentially, um, right now we're using Angular's version of what they deem as web components, um, and the interface is just like web components with content tag, etc. Um, but then, like you could also just inject like this optional tag where, if native components is supported, then use this. And then um, in the future, your application will work. Uh, today and in the future, because in the future it will just work um, in web components, uh, native web components, which will have performance implications, like good performance implications, presumably because um, you're able to write the code in like lower levels eventually, um, and that's what that's why like it's so great to to kind of advocate web components because it's kind of like pushing the web forward and um, allowing frameworks to compose together, and that's kind of the goal of uh, Yes, yeah, it's, it's a short call, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, awesome. I think that those are good answers. Uh, so this other question by Jeff, 
uh, well, please. The integration to web components right now allows Angular components to access web components, but not, not vice versa. We kind of mentioned that. Um, will there be a time in the future when web components could access an Angular component? I hope that doesn't mean I have to include all of Angular 2 in my web component. <laughs> It, it does, right? I mean, if you don't have Angular 2, you don't have the component. Uh, so time will tell. Um, I haven't seen a compelling use case to do that, right? Uh, given how Angular 2 works uh, with, like, uh, basically having, you know, we have one digest cycle and so on. We have a few kind of application level things. Um, including little application level things within your small web components does not make much sense right now. But uh, of course, we, uh, nobody knows, right? Uh, we're, we'll see. Yeah, but I, it's I not our priority. Yeah, I would say that um, every solution brings new problems. Um, and this is a pretty new solution. Uh, and I, I would say it's a great solution. Uh, so we've got just some more, some more time, uh, time to tell. So great, final question. Um, and this is, um, for, man, I need to ask this guy how to say his name because he asks questions all the time. But his name's uh, Jurgen Vandemore. I hope that's right. Um, but his question is, is anyone already using Polymer in production? And um, I say, what, Polymer? Yuck. No, just kidding. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll really quick answer. I know that Google Music just shipped a, a redesign or a rewrite maybe uh, that all uses uh, Polymer. Anybody else know anyone else that's uh, using Polymer? Silence. OK. Um, um, so we, we have, I think, a few internal apps uh, that use uh, Polymer widgets within an Angular application. Yeah, we, we did the same thing. And um, I also think, I think I've heard that Google, the Google I.O. website was using Web Components. And I also know that the Web Components website is using Web Components. So, yeah. <laughs> Cool. I, I think it's still, like uh, like has been mentioned earlier, it's still a pretty new technology. Uh, spec is changing as, as we go. So that might be an explanation um, for, uh, for that. So cool. Uh, so let's just go ahead and wrap, uh, wrap things up. We've um, got some time for picks and tips. So um, yeah, we'll, we'll just go ahead and start. Um, and Amy, it looks like you've tried again. Can I hear you? Nope, I can't hear you. <laughs> I'm so sorry. So Amy, if you could put your picks and tips um, as uh, links in the Hangout. And actually, that applies to everybody. Please put your picks and tips as links in the Hangout um, event, not in our chat, but in the actual Hangout event uh, comments. That'd be great. Um, OK, uh, Carmen, could we have you uh, give us your picks and tips? You're muted, Carmen. This is just a really silent show today. <laughs> Can you hear me now? <laughs> yeah. OK, cool. So um, there is this very cool website uh, called uh, Web Components. Uh, yeah, it's webcomponents.org. Go there and check it out. It has very, a lot of cool stuff, a lot of cool articles, um, a lot of cool presentations about this. Um, and yeah, it will for sure answer a lot of questions about the components. So yeah, do that. That's my pick and tip. Cool, thanks. Um, Kara? Um, kind of in that same vein, um, there's a great HTML5 rocks series of tutorials on web components. Um, specifically, I think they have three Shadow DOM articles, um, or and I think they have one for each um, spec. That's a really good thing to check out if you don't really um, know a lot about web components. And the other thing, I think there was also a, a great blog post by Victor Savkin about um, Angular 2 components that kind of um, shows Angular 2 components, but also has some web components stuff in it, too. So I'll link that in the Hangout. Great. Patrick, JS. Yes, so uh, mine is the same as uh, last week's, and that is solve for the simplest case before, um, when, you're, when you're solving a hard problem or something, always solve for the simplest case first, 
and then you refactor it out. This is similar to like writing an essay and creating drafts. You create many drafts before you're done with the actual essay. So like same thing applies for like programming as well. Like you, you solve for the simplest, you do the dumbest way possible just to get it working, and then from there you're, it's easier for you to to choose um, or it's easier for you to figure out like what you should refactor it out. So that's my that's my tip. I love that tip um, because lots of times you wind up in this paralysis where you can't actually you, you don't actually start coding because you're too worried about um, not covering edge cases that wind up never actually being needed to be covered. Yeah, so it's solving that problem for sure. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, uh, Rachel. Are you there, Rachel? It looks I like am. You're... Okay. okay. All right. Um, so. When we include our CSS into our UI components, um, we're going to need to test that a lot more than maybe we're currently doing. So um, I want to uh, recommend CSSTE.st. Uh, this website that has a lot of information about testing CSS. Oh, that sounds interesting. I'll have to t give it a look. Cool. Rado. All right. Um... So first one is uh, the Google JavaScript style guide. I think it's always, uh, if you're working in an organization when uh, your coworkers are always arguing about uh, indentation and so on, uh, I, I just find out, I talk to people and they don't know that we open source our style guides and those are exactly the same ones we use internally. So uh, it, it, I think it, it would solve your, uh, your, a lot of your productivity issues. Uh, if you just stick to one style guide and you don't need to argue all the time on code reviews about indentation and commas and so on. So that's my coding tip, uh, my coding uh, pick, and I have a non-coding one which I think is very interesting. Uh, it is the 100-day project, uh, and this is a creativity exercise where every day you do uh, the same creative uh, process, basically, it's supposed to be something quick, like let's say you make hundred days for hundred days you make hundred posters, or you draw hundred paintings, or uh, maybe you do hundred web components. So I didn't do it this year, but uh, my wife is doing it. So I want to do it next year. Hundred web components. components. No, maybe I'll do a hundred tests, and then I'll call call life good. No, just kidding. Just as good. The, the point is to repeat the same thing, but it's a little bit different, and you basically train your creativity. Cool. Love it. All right, Scott. I'll, leave, I'll save myself for last, I guess. Okay, so I got two picks and one tip. Uh, one pick is Ramjet by Rich Harris. It's a pretty sweet animation morphing library. Animates two elements together across some like, path. I think it's really legit. Uh, another pick is native script um, because it's pretty legit. It's going to be using TypeScript, and I hear they're working with the Google team over there at Angular to, to be able to write native applications, Android and iOS, with just TypeScript and a Domless version of Angular 2. So that sounds pretty awesome. Uh, uh, and then that is, for, that is for, true. Uh, yeah. j just to follow up quickly, uh, this is one of the benefits of not fully embracing web components and just kind of pick and choosing uh, because we're not tied to the DOM platform and we can do things with native widgets which don't have exactly the same APIs as DOM elements. Uh, but since our components are not tied to the DOM APIs, we can do things like that. Yep, super awesome. Can't wait for that. Um, and then for a tip, um, I do a lot of education. I get a lot of people to ask me questions about how to get started with certain technologies and stuff. And one thing that I always tell them is, it's like think about like trying to learn how to swim. Like you can take lessons, and it could take you months, you know, to be able to feel comfortable to learn how to swim. Or you can just have your friend push you in, and then you might drown, or you'll learn how to swim. But you really never drown. You only have the fear of almost drowning. Your friend will actually save you, so you don't really have any risk. So if you want to learn something new, just jump right in. You know, maybe get your feet wet, and that's just reading the docs, and then just jump right in and build something. Don't Go watch videos and read books. Just jump right in and start drowning because you're going to learn a lot faster that way. The same thing applies for food. So, like, if you if you want it, <laughs> this is how I, like I learned chopsticks. But essentially, like, if you're starving, you'll do anything to eat food. So, like, that's how you introduce yourself to like 
wild food. You just like starve yourself, and then suddenly you're just so hungry, you just want to eat it. Um, so I taught myself chopsticks because I was so hungry, and I didn't know how to use chopsticks, and it was the only thing I could use to eat it. So totally tangent, but yeah. I think that's just validation for what Scott is saying. Um, yeah. <laughs> Patrick, you, I love you. You're awesome. <laughs> Okay, uh, so I'll just give my quick tips, and somebody's trying to kick me out of my room, which I have reserved for another 15 minutes, I should add. Um, but uh, so my picks, I, this is a self-pick um, newspaper code structure, um, an angular newspaper code structure. These are uh, just some philosophies I, I have for my, um, the way that I structure my code to make your, your module consumable and maintainable. Uh, so these are just some blog posts that I posted out last week. Um, I'd love some feedback on these concepts. And then uh, another tech pick is JS Bin. Uh, I use this for pretty much everything. I know that the Angular community is all in on Flunker, but uh, give JS Bin a try. Um, I like it a lot. It's it's really nice. Um, and the fact that it's not built with Angular makes it actually easier, a little bit easier to um, debug Angular stuff in, uh, which I've yeah, found to be true. And then finally, Studio C. Has anybody heard of Studio C before? You can just wave. Yeah, nobody. Man, Studio C is hilarious. Uh, so it's uh, my alma mater, BYU, um, had just started this uh, program on, on BYU TV um, called Studio C, and it's the um, improv, or not improv, but a, um, a sketch comedy, and it's hilarious. Uh, so they have a YouTube channel, um, and I will link to that. But it's yeah, it's super hilarious. Go check it out. Maybe I'll I'll pick a specific episode in the in the comments. But anyway, um, I think that's our show. Unless anybody has any last words before we uh, finish this off. Okay, I think we're good. So um, yeah, we'll, uh, just closing up with a couple last announcements. Uh, next week again, it's Angular internals with uh, Tara uh, Parvian and then. I'm sorry, uh, Taro. Um, uh, next week is, uh, uh, yeah, it's uh, June 2nd, same time, same place. And then follow us on Twitter and Google Plus to stay up with the latest. And, uh, yeah, with, uh, without any further ado, uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. Really appreciate it. I just wanted to be known that Patrick wore a dress shirt. He has a collar on his shirt. I just want everybody <laughs> yeah. to know that. There is a collar <laughs> on Patrick's shirt today, guys. Remember to screenshot it. Tell your mom. Tell everybody. <laughs> So the, the context here is that I used to wear a lot of hoodies. <laughs> the last two shows I've been wearing college shirts, so. <laughs> you don't need to dress up for this show, bro. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, I have, like, new wardrobe, so whatever. <laughs> cool. I used to wear college shirts a lot, so, like, yeah. Nice. All right, cool. Well, um, thanks, everybody, for showing up, and uh, we'll catch everybody next week. See ya. Peace.